Hi guys, Pastor Matt Chandler here. Pray uh, that this sermon, this resource, uh, be used by God in conjunction with you belonging to a local church uh, to grow you and sanctify you in your faith. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at TBC? You can do that either through the app or you can go online to TBC Resources uh, and give there. Again, pray that this blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. Good morning, y'all. My name is Joshua Rogg. My wife Kaylee and I have been members at this campus about four years. We've gotten the opportunity to serve in both home groups and in steps. This morning, I'm gonna be uh, reading from Romans 8, 14 through 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Killed it. Thanks, man. Uh, Well, good morning. Um, Good morning. Thank you. Um, Before we dive in, um, I, I have to give an update uh, on uh, the civil matter that was closed out this past week, and I hate that I have to do this. Like, I, I want to talk about adoption and the beauty of the gospel, and, the, and I'll, I'll explain the why I feel like I have to do it. Um, but before I dive in, uh, I want to start by saying, if you, I, I know that the things I have to say are very difficult Um, and that for some of you, they're going to be more difficult than others. Uh, And so I have to address a a case uh, of uh, sexual abuse at a kid's camp from 2012. If you're new here, uh, this has been an ongoing thing since 2019. But but here, before we dive into any of that, if you're a survivor, if you're uh, at any point where we talk about this, you find yourself being triggered, here's what uh, I just want to, man, you pick up your phone, scroll through, grab a Bible, try to root yourself in the present, get up and leave. It's completely up to you on how you handle. Just remember your mind will tell you, uh, or your body will tell you before your mind will. Uh, and so, so be mindful of your body as we kind of walk through this. And then it's, you you can, you can do whatever you want to do. You can leave, come back in a couple of minutes. You you can, uh, breathe. uh, You, you, you will know how how to, uh, kind of root yourself in this moment as opposed to, uh, be pulled back uh, into some place that you're not right now. And so again, I hate that we're having to do this, but I'm convinced that we have to. So I, I, I want to talk about it. I want to give you the why, and then we need to pray. And so I'm going to stick to this because there's some legalese, and, and I don't need to freestyle on legalese. Uh, and so let me just walk through the update. If you've been here for some years, you'll recall that in September of 2018, uh, we informed you, the congregation, that an investigation was underway uh, into a report of sexual abuse at the 2012 kids camp that we went to. It wasn't our camp, it was a camp that we went to. Now, um, in January of 2019, the family worked with the Dallas County District Attorney's Office to bring criminal charges against the accused, a former Village Church staff member named Matt Tony. And then they later brought civil claims against the Village Church that June. The original complaint against the Village Church included a laundry list of claims, but on April 30th, 2021, they reduced their claims to negligence, gross negligence, and intentional infliction of emotional distress under a general theory that we did not lock the bunk room doors and did not assign an adult to stay awake throughout the night. In August of 2020, the Dallas County District Attorney's Office dismissed the criminal charges against Matt Tony, stating, quote, 
The fact remains that the complainant cannot and has not positively identified Matt Tony as the person who committed the offense, end quote. In the latter part of 2021, the charges were fully expunged from Matt Tony's record. On August 1st, this past Monday, the Village Church and the individual known as Jane Doe One came to a resolution and the civil litigation case was dismissed from the Dallas County Court. Now, why do I feel like we need to talk about this in the gathering this weekend? Um, I, I don't, this is not, I can tell you what it's not. It, it's not like a PR damage control thing in, in my heart. What it is, is that over a thousand of you every week trust us with the souls of your children. And there are hundreds, and this is why I hate the word, there are hundreds of you. I mean, I saw your faces when I was mingling before service. There are hundreds of you that the Holy Spirit has started a deep work of healing and restoration and redemption from the kind of trauma that we're talking about here today. And, and I know that that healing can be really fragile when you have to talk about things li like this. And so the why behind it isn't kind of damage control. The why behind it is I want you to know that we take the, the care of your children and we take the care of your soul very, very seriously. And so after a thorough and lengthy legal investigation, we maintain and firmly believe that we committed no wrong in, regard, in regards to child safety or mandatory reporting. It has been our practice to exceed the standard of care as it relates to child safety. We believe firmly that we responded to the accusation with responsibility and care. Jane Doe One's report was trusted. And we double reported the abuse allegations to the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, as well as fully and voluntarily submitted to the authority of the lead detective on the case. We sought the best we knew how to care for this family from the campus that they were attending. We had five campuses back then. They were at the South Lake campus. Throughout the course of this legal process, we have maintained our hope is for healing and justice. That still continues. We will continue to take accusations or suspicions of abuse seriously. We provide training to all of our staff, our elders, our deacons, and key lay leaders to increase awareness and make sure there is an understanding on the filing of reports. The Village Church believes that all churches should mandatorily report all accusations. We are not detectives. We are not the police. We are not experts in this field. We want to turn it over to the experts and let them run point, which is what we did in this case. If you are a survivor here, if you are in that process of being put back together, I want you to hear me say we are committed to being a safe place for the ongoing healing of your soul. If you have children here, I want you to hear me say we are incredibly serious about doing everything we possibly can in regards to training and best practices to make sure they are kept out of harm's way. This has been a heartbreaking ordeal on all sorts of levels, most, most certainly for this family, but for us as we've tried to navigate spaces, we're not trained, for, I'm certainly not trained for this. And so our hope is that the God of the Bible who says that even darkness is of light to him, sees all things, knows all things, will in time heal all things, and we can trust in his good and sovereign hand. And so I want us to spend some time praying, not as just kind of a you know, little trite way. I want to seriously lay these things at the feet of King Jesus in the expectation that the Holy Spirit in time will heal, bring forth justice, and continue to work for his good pleasure and our joy. There's nowhere else to take it. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your goodness and grace. And I thank you that how things that are heavy and hard like this is. Um, Father, you, you will 
redeem and, and you will um, work in in ways that are beyond kind of our imagination. I do thank you that there's nothing hidden from you. There is no darkness in you. Uh, and so I pray um, for this family and this young woman in particular. I pray that in time, Father, that she would uh, love and serve your kingdom by loving and serving other women um, who have been hurt, who have been traumatized. Who, uh, Father, I, I just ask that you would give her a vibrant, joyful relationship with you that leads to beautiful ministry with other women and those who have been harmed. I pray for this church. I pray that you would supernaturally protect and heal here. Just pray that you would expose predators quickly and then you'd give us the fortitude to put them down. We ask for your grace to wash over it all. This is a broken, messy, terrible world and I thank you that you let us carry light in it. Above all, we just ask for mercy to cover everything. Help us. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen. Let me say this last word. If you're a survivor in here, and, and maybe something this morning has triggered something that is, you can feel it building, or, or maybe something's happened and you've never told anyone I want to encourage you to reach out to our care department. That's Summer Vincenberger and Megan Gray. They, they are fully trained for that and, and would love to walk alongside of you and serve you in any way uh, they possibly can. Again, I want you to feel safe in this place and, and I want you to continue to be able to heal w- without, without breaking as best we can by the grace of God, okay? So this is a great, great group of women to connect with. Now, um, we're in week three. This is just such a hard transition, isn't it? We're, we're in week three of what we called every angle. And, and what we've done is we're looking at the gospel message that Christ has come into the world to save sinners, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross absorbing God's wrath towards those who would believe, and he was resurrected as the evidence that the bill has been paid in full. That's the gospel. From there, we've started to look at it from different angles. We looked at it from uh, the angle of justification, that you and I cannot justify ourselves by the work of our hands or our our bloodlines, or it doesn't matter that mom and dad were Christians. It doesn't matter that we used to get high and now we don't. Those things aren't the things that matter. It's Jesus that justifies us by his blood and nothing else can justify us. And we said, there's coming a day in the mercy of God where by his grace, you realize that you're not what you thought you were. It'll be horribly painful. And in that moment, you will either seek to justify yourself by looking at others and kind of comparing yourself to others, or you will throw yourself on the mercy of Jesus. And if you throw yourself on the mercy of Jesus, it's then and then alone that you're justified. So we don't pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We throw ourselves onto the mercy of Jesus. And then last week, we talked about what it meant to be a new creation, this kind of ontological newness that occurs when Christ comes and reigns and rules in our hearts. It changes how we see and experience and understands, understand the world. It shifts our mind. It shifts our heart. We literally get a new heart. We value new things. We desire new things. We're, we're made new by the blood of Jesus. And then that brings me to this week, which I think for our area and and this part of the country could be the one that unlocks it for many of us. And that's this idea of adoption and this idea of being sons and daughters of God. Uh, I have this conversation with my three kids. I've actually had it a lot with them. It's not like that one-off. It's like the, I'm gonna have this conversation as much as I can by the grace of God. And I know that it is by the grace of God. All three of my kids, they want to please us. I know that not everybody gets that. Like some people, you get a kid or two, they're like, don't care. Like all three of ours, but they, they want to please us. Like they, they desire to not disappoint us, to not let us down. That, that's a powerful thing. It's not lost on me how powerful that is. In fact, that urge is so powerful, they might just be shady to try to not disappoint. And, and so here's the conversation. I, I'm telling you, I've had this con- I had this conversation two weeks ago with my son. You are going to disappoint me. I am going to disappoint you. And the love that we have with one another will hold it together. There is no way 
for us to do real life. Now, we could pretend, we could hide from one another, we could create distance, but to do life like your daddy wants to do life. I, we've just got to accept, I'm going to fail you. I'm going to let you down. You're going to fail me. You're going to let me down. You're going to drive me crazy. And there's nothing you can do ever that would make me not want a deep, intimate relationship with you. Now, you, you've got all the power there. Maybe something might happen. You don't want to be anywhere near me. But you couldn't do anything. Like, I'm, I'm thought through it. You couldn't do anything that would kill my desire for closeness and intimacy with you. Now, Jesus in Matthew 7 tries to, you know, draw my attention to the fact that there's something in that moment for me and something in that moment for you. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 11. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Um, here's my father confession. I'm human. You? Like in your parenting? Any other humans involved here? Okay, so, so we'll talk about what that means. Um, <laughs> any, any, any of you parents, are you inconsistent and selfish? Anybody inconsistent and selfish? Um, anybody in here ever over-discipline? <laughs> Under-discipline? Snap and say something ridiculous? goodness, that was universal. I don't think I've ever asked a question that got such a universal response. So, so what Jesus is saying here right out of the gate is, hey, hey, look, you, you're, 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 you're like evil fathers. Like you're inconsistent. You, you like snap, you blow up and it's ridiculous. And if you could listen to yourself, you'd feel shame, right? Like you, you have this urge in you to do this well. And man, you kind of are, but by and large, me. And, and Jesus is trying to draw the attention to, and if that's you, and, and if your kids are as disobedient or as obedient as they are, and you, you know in your heart, I want to be near this kid. I, I want an intimate relationship with them. I want to know them. I want to know what's going on in their heart. I want to know what, if that's you, how much more? Does your heavenly father long to be near to you and long, right, for an intimate relationship with you where there's nearness and not distance? So Jesus is trying to like lift up our heads as parents and go, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I get the, the impulse to, to be near, to love, to want to walk in the light, to not have distance, to not have secrets, to know one another and cheer one another on. To, like, I get that, but you as inconsistent as you are at pulling that off. Imagine your heavenly father who's always consistent, who is love. It's not something he has, it's something that he is, who is ferociously committed to pursuing you and knowing you and making a way for a deep, close, intimate relationship. How much more does he want that? And I think most evangelicals, they, they, don't, they, they, don't, they can't quite process God like that. So let's look at our passage. Romans 8, starting in verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit, notice that's a capital S, of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So, so the first part of this passage is we think about being children of God as a, as a way of understanding the gospel, the good news of, uh, of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is that you no longer have, so you used to have, but you no longer have, it has not been given to you, the spirit of fear, or the spirit of slavery that leads to fear. Now, what's in view as the Apostle Paul unpacks the gospel with this metaphor is, hey, you were once enslaved and that enslavement led to fear. And we were enslaved by anything that we trusted in for our salvation or for the fullness of life that can't bear up under the weight of it. And there's four of them. All right. No, we're Baptists, but there's four, not three. And here's 
Here are the four. The the first would be, uh, where do we go to find salvation? Where do we go to make sense of life? Where do we go to be happy? Where do we go to kind of fill that place in us that feels a little empty? Well, we run to the self. Like we run to us. Like we have to fix that. We have to make that right. And historically, that's looked like self-righteousness, self-pity, or self-sufficiency. That, that would be kind of if I drew a scale for you and we could, I had a whiteboard up here, which I probably will never, I'll never going to do, make sermons longer, I'd play with it. And, and so it, it can be, uh, it literally, it can be self-righteousness. Remember that sermon on justification from a couple weeks ago? I'm great. I'm better than him. Look at her. I'm a better mom than her. I'm a better, right? It, it's self-justification, self-righteousness, or, or it's self-pity. Like you can't see any goodness in you, any beauty in you, all you see is where you're terrible. Or self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency is just the low-key belief that you have that you're God. And you would never say that. I can't imagine that you would say that. You a spiritual man? I am. (laughs) What do you believe in? Myself. Now, that's the way it's historically been looked at. In the modern moment, we're in a day of individual expressive, well, it's expressive individualism is what the sociologists are calling it. And it's this idea that for you to be saved, you gotta take the journey inward. I don't know what that is. I probably won't do that again. You gotta (laughs) take this. Yeah, I think this is better than this. Like, you've gotta take this journey inward and what you're looking for, here, look at me. This This is exactly what's happened. This is exactly what our kids are being told. This is exactly what we're being wooed and drawn into the wilderness to put to death. This is the lie. Then I need to go in and I need to find my deepest desires. And those deepest desires are who I am. And once I find those deepest desires, I need to orient my life around that by finding people who will say, yeah, you are those desires. Those are actually our desires too. And then there's my community. Right? Now, (laughs) your desires will be constantly shifting. That makes you a slave to fear. How exhausting is it to to completely reinvent yourself every three years? To have nothing external that helps you understand who and what you are. Nothing timeless, nothing rooted in history and reality. Just your desires, your impulses, your compulsions. That if you could be honest for a second and dial in, kind of are making you miserable. So it's the idea of self as salvation. If that's not it, it's others. Man, we look to others to solve what's wrong with us. Don't we? Listen, I, I think I married an exceptional woman who's a really crummy God. I, just, I think Lauren can do just about anything I can think of. She makes me sick. Like she could just decide to be good at something and go be good at it. That's not me. I got like three gifts. And then like, besides that, I, I can like hardly let me out of the house. I, when I entered into marriage, this is our, our first seven years were brutal, like awful, awful, brutal. Like, oh my gosh, is this the rest of my life? Awful. If that makes you uncomfortable. I hope it actually helps you. What I brought to our marriage is a deep need for Lauren to heal some things that were broken in me that she had no capacity to heal. No ability to get into that stuff. And so here I am, naive and dumb, running into marriage, expecting Lauren to heal every wound of my heart. That's an impossible pressure. It's an impossible pressure to put on a spouse, to put on a friend group, to put on your coworkers, to put on your job, to put on your right. This others get to define me. Others get to uh, kind of help me uh, experience peace and, and wholeness. And, and it, it makes you a slave to fear because what happens if she doesn't love me? What happens if they reject me? What, oh my gosh, now I better do whatever they think I should do. Now I can't even have an opinion because if they reject me, my whole world burns to the ground. You become a slave to fear. And then the third is the world. And I don't mean like going for a nature hike and like finding yourself, you know, in a national park or anything like that. Uh, the, when the Bible talks about the world, they're talking about a, a way of viewing reality that's inconsistent with God's good design. And we read this in Romans 12, verse two, it says, do not be conformed to this world. So don't be conformed. This world sees things a certain way. Don't you get conformed to that, but rather 
Be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The call of the Christian life is to be in the world, but not of it. To be separate, even as we participate in. Are you tracking with me on that? And and I think for the moment we're in, that means we embrace, radically, compassionately embrace the Christian, historic, orthodox view of sex, of marriage, and of money. If you do that, you are you're going to be really annoying. And I want, I want you to hear me say this. Here, lean in. This is a seat. Lean in. They're never going to think we're cool. And, and I'm telling you, like, I, I love you. Jesus doesn't need you to give them a makeover. It's like, oh, man, you're just, you're just the kids today. They're just not going to. I need you to flex on some of these weird personality quirks that you have. Like, like, the, like you'll, you, you, you dilute it, you kill it. You dilute it, you kill it. Why those three things? Well, because those are the most public-facing, twisted, perverse abuses of our day. They're also the most low-hanging fruit to display Christian beauty. You want to see the beautiful design of God? Look to this. You want to see the wisdom of God made manifest? Look to this. So the people of God, they root themselves in the scriptures. They root themselves in in the history of God's good graces across time. And and because what's going to happen is there are plenty of people out there that are Christians that go, you know, God just, he, man, so sorry. He was a little old school. He's always eternal. You know how those guys are. So the, now we figured it out now. And you'll find, literally, I'm telling you, you'll find theologians, whatever that means. They will come out and say, this has been wrong for 4,000 years. We just now, in this moment, just so happens to correlate with the way culture's going. But <laughs> the church has been wrong for 4,000 years. So. Now, we're going to correct it. We're going to be the ones that, it's called chronological snobbery. That's what C.S. Lewis called it. So so how do we not conform to the pattern of this world? We look at the biblical, historical, Christian view on sex, marriage, and money. And for all the, how do you agree upon that? You agree upon, it's in the creeds, it's you can't agree. It's like a bait and switch to try to make you think that's unknowable. It's a lie, it's absolutely knowable. You won't find it in the world. Listen, I I get you can be lonely. You're not going to solve loneliness with a bunch of different sexual partners and and buying a bunch of trinkets and toys. If anything, you're going to have pleasure in a moment and a lot of heartbreak after. A lot of shame you have to carry. But anyone want to testify? Great pleasure in the moment. Ton of shame the next day. And so you're almost doomed to kind of repeat yourself to get that shame to go away that only adds to more shame. And now you're on a treadmill for your soul that's going to run you to death. You won't find it in self. You won't find it in others. You won't find it in the world. And then lastly, you won't find it in religion. Now, I lament that the word religion has moved from kind of its historic meaning to the more modern meaning of like something negative, something bad, right? So when I'm using religion in this sermon, I'm talking about it in its modern context, how it's understood. This idea of outside in, rule following, tilt the scales in my favor with goodness outweighing bad that makes me a good person and gets me into heaven if there is one, right? Now, there's this great story, C.S. Lewis, he's at Cambridge. I don't know if the story's true, it's kind of legend. I've been looking for it, I haven't found it, but it's a story, it's a good story, so I'm gonna use it. Um, so he's at Cambridge and he walks past this room and there's a bunch of professors in the room and they had written out all the world's religions on the chalkboard and things about those religions and, and they asked Lewis to come in. So I like to imagine Lewis smoking a pipe. He's not Baptist and he's English, so he's got a pipe, you know, most reluctant convert in all of London. So he sticks his head in the room, you know, just that sweet smell. They didn't know about secondhand smoke yet. He's innocent. And, um, and they said, Hey, what's the difference? Clive. 
I mean, there they all are. What's the difference? And so C.S. Lewis, who cold as ice, puffed his pipe twice. This is complete make-believe. Now at this point, <laughs> this is absurd. Says to the room, that's easy. <laughs> I'm sorry, honey. Grace. And then he threw down his pipe and walked out of the room. You see what he did there? In, in that moment, he's like, oh, there's something different. Yeah, not all the world's religions are a bunch of, you follow these rules, you've got to tip the scales in your favor. The reason that all makes you a slave is you'll never know what the scales are. So you will perpetually be trying to earn something. Listen, I love you. Scales don't exist. That's not how God has chosen to do this. It's not how he revealed himself. Your good outweighing your bad in regards to God's glory and salvation means jack squat. You'll be a slave to fear the rest of God. You, you will create distance from God when you think you've messed up the scales. But remember the opening illustration? God doesn't want any distance between you. That's, the way, that's why he did what he's done. That's why Christ has come, because God doesn't want distance. He wants intimacy. He wants nearness. He wants you to come to him with that moment of, dang it, something landed on this scale. I really blew it. And I've said for 20 years that you'll know you understand the gospel by what you do when you blow it. It's not when you're doing great that you, you can see, like made manifest that this person loves the gospel and trusts in it. It's when you blow it, like you blow it big. Remember back to week one, justification. It's not the, the Pharisee, but praise God, I'm not like this man. It's the guy that's beating his chest and saying, woe is me that Jesus says, that's the guy that goes home justified. He's a tax collector. He's a terrible person. But he threw himself on the mercy of Jesus. And Jesus says, my son, my guy, my people. Now, each of these will keep you locked up, jammed up, enslaved. But the passage doesn't end there. So Paul goes on and goes, that's not you. That, that's not the gospel. You have not been given a spirit of slavery that pulls you back into fear, but rather you have been given the spirit of adoption. Notice that's a capital S spirit of adoption. Well, the spirit of slavery was lowercase. So what we have here in that capital S spirit is somebody's name. Third person of the Trinity. You have been given the spirit of adoption. The Holy Spirit comes, dwells inside of you, seals you, and by that sealing, you cry out, Abba, Father. Now, now this is an interesting little game Paul's playing here. I don't think it's a game. I think it's a game game. He uses two of the same words, one in Aramaic, one in Greek. If you just looked at it on the surface, it looks like, Father, Father, you have received the spirit of adoption by which you call out, Father, Father, except... Abba in Aramaic has um, some, some implications in it uh, of great intimacy. It's almost better translated daddy. And that's why, let, man, let's just, cards on the table. Anybody got that friend that when they pray, they're like, daddy God? Anybody got that guy, gal? Like, here's the thing. I, I got it. They're biblically right. It, I, just, I don't like it. And I just like, daddy, papa. Daddy, just want to, I'm just like, please quit calling him daddy. I get it. It's in the Bible. Abba, I know where you're getting it. It's just so, I love him. I, I'm, I love him. I, I try to put my life in his presence, but will you stop that? And uh, if that's, please don't, you just keep daddy in it up, right? Even if I'm in the room, you just do it. I am not judging you. I am thinking that's biblical because that's biblical. And, and one of the things Paul's trying to get you to understand, look at me, about your heavenly father is two things. One, the great intimacy with which he wants a relationship with you, Abba, and the great power with which he'll exercise his fatherly power to make sure you make it home. Let me show you that. He, here's, here's, well, yeah. Here's what, can I tell you what I'm afraid of for you? I think in a place like ours, this area, we are in real danger of God being an inference, but not reality. 
Like, here's what I mean. I I think almost everybody in this area probably has a a Bible verse or something on their, you know, Facebook page. You know, Steve, work in construction, Philippians 121. Debbie, sell essential oils. Is that not fair? Should I not have done that? (laughs) Lawyer, we're going to make you a lawyer so I don't get in trouble. All right? Lawyer. Right? Jeremiah 29, 11. And, and what can happen if we're, I mean, I shouldn't be joking because I'm trying to make this land with some weight. I think too many of us know about him and don't know him. And this intimacy that we've been invited into by a father who doesn't want any distance, any distance, don't matter your background, no matter, he doesn't want any distance. He wants to close the gap. He wants to grab you up. But most of us know, like we know some celebrity we stalk on Instagram. And it ought not be so. In fact, I love this quote. It would be a tragedy if you went through life, like A.W. Tozer says, trying to love an ideal and be loyal to a mere principle. What a tragedy. When the creator of the universe longs for intimacy, you have an experiential, I know he's here, I know he loves me, relationship with the living God, exchanging that for a principle or an ideal. Far too many of you have labored far too long out from under the intimate power of a heavenly father. Let, let me show you those two ideas. Here's, here's intimacy. And I'm telling you, I, it's a very, you know when you meet somebody who gets this and believes it. This is Zephaniah 317. The Lord your God is in your midst. I love that. Um, I want as a father, when I'm home, I, I want everyone from my wife to my children to feel, oh, dad's here. So we're safe. We, we know everything's going to be okay. I want to be a non-anxious presence. You tracking with me? Like, and, and here's God saying, the Lord is in your midst. Now I'm not away from you. I am not created distance. The Lord, your God is in your midst. Listen to this, a mighty one who will save. Listen to this. He rejoices over you with gladness. Do you believe that? Like God rejoices over you with gladness. Now, if you've got kids or you were a kid with somewhat of a healthy parent, you've experienced some level of this. Like none of my kids are the finished product yet. All of my kids have things that make me want to pull my hair out. And I can rejoice over all of them with gladness. You tracking with me? Like I'm not, dang, once they stop that, I can finally love them. Right? I'm not giggling, guys. Like, this is how God, feel the text. This is the text. It says God rejoices over you with gladness. Man, I don't know if your daddy could do that. My guess is maybe he couldn't. And so that jacks you up, man. You start thinking that God must be like your earthly father who, who was cold or couldn't show emotion or wouldn't enter in or maybe was angry all the time. And this is going, no, no, he's not that kind of dad. If you who are evil know how to be, how much more is your heavenly father? And he's not only in your midst, but he's just looking at your age, just rejoicing in gladness. Man, you're not there. I know you're not there. We're not there. I get that. He gets it. Rejoices over you with gladness. Why would you run from him? Why would you create space from him? Who would avoid being rejoiced over with gladness? Like, I love that phrase because he's not like frustrated by it. Well, I made a promise, so I got to do that. (laughs) Didn't know what I was getting into when I started all that. It's not rejoices over you in gladness. Brothers, you believe that? Sisters, you believe that? Not waiting for you to be what you'll be. He's all in right now. All in. He knows where he's taking you. And he knows that you're going to move slow. Walk with a limp. Touch stuff he told you not to touch 4,000 times. (laughs) Right? Can't say more without incriminating my children. So, intimate. I don't want there to be distance. I'm in your midst. I'm moving towards. What is the gospel except the heralding that God has drawn near? The freedom from the enslavement of the four bigs. But he's not just desiring intimacy. He's bringing power to the table. In Deuteronomy 24, it says this. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. A couple of things. 
Um, here's the first. I, I want you to notice that this didn't say, I, I am the Lord your God. Have a seat in the living room. Get your favorite beverage, and I'm going to go whip your enemies. That's not what he said. He didn't say, let go and let me. That's not what he said. Because I think that would make a terrible father. But because he's an all-powerful father, he says, I'm coming with you, and I got you. There'll be no hurt befall you today, not while I'm here. All right, so this, if Abba carries that kind of daddy idea, this, this Greek word father carries this idea of power. It's the, I know Gen Xers did this, I don't know, behind me, but that's like, my, my, my dad could beat up your dad. The kids still do that? Maybe not, maybe y'all are, I don't know. But, <laughs> like it's this idea of like, are you serious? Have you seen my dad? Oh, but have you seen my dad? Do you think I'd be anxious about that? Like, what are you going to do to me? Have you seen my pops? You know how wealthy my father is? You know how powerful my father is? Like, what are you going to do to me so you have this father that desires nearness and intimacy and moves towards you now, rejoicing over you in gladness? I love this other sentence in Zephyrah 3, 17, and it's my favorite. It says, he will quiet you by his love. He will quiet you by his love. Um, I, I can only speak for men because I am one, but the, there are times as a man, I don't know whether I'm angry or sad. Am I alone in that brothers? Am I it's just like, everybody's looking at me. Like I've got this like unique issue. They're just like, you should contact Summer Burger from the care department. And I have. No, there, there's a, um, There is a level of nurturing um, that for reasons I won't get into, I, I missed out on. And, and this aspect of intimacy with the Father is this, hey, just come climb up in my lap and sit here. There's no lecture waiting for me there. There's no corrective coming right there. It's just sit here. And the quietness of his love establishes peace and saves me from being enslaved to fear. And then there's his power. His power to deliver, to walk with, to, to never abandon, to never leave, to be present, to not grow weary of me. Like even the people who know me best and love me most get weary of me. but not my heavenly father. Now, Jesus gives us this beautiful picture of what this looks like. Because come on, it sounds too good to be true, man. Luke 15, starting in verse 11. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, man, those young ones, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. You see the enslavement? who sent him into the field to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. It's my favorite sentence in the Bible. But when he came to himself, I have prayed all week that you this morning would come to your senses. You would come to yourself. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. Listen to this. This is ridiculous. But while he was still a ways off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. 
And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. And they began to celebrate. So so here, listen to me. Some of you still have the speech that you want to give God about why you'd make a good servant. Some of you keep coming in going, "Ah, man, I'm going to do this and I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to stop doing this. And man, I think you might be able to use me here. And you've got a father that scans the horizon at your return who's been waiting to just see your outline on the horizon. And when he sees you who spent your blessing on reckless living, the older brother later would say devoured your property with prostitutes. He doesn't even respond to your little deal that you tried to work out with him. Hey, you, I'll just be your servant, Lord. I'll just do these good things for you. And he's, he's not having it. He's your father. And fathers don't make slaves of their children. So he's not going to make the deal with you guys. He's not going to let you try to earn his love. He's not going to let you enslave yourself to trying to earn from him what he's freely giving you. He refuses to let you turn yourself into a slave when what he wants is intimacy and to use his power to protect you. And so here's here's the offer that echoes through the doctrine of adoption. You ready? Won't you come home? Won't you come home? And maybe you're like the younger brother here. He's like, oh my gosh. I've just squandered my wealth. God's blessed me with so many things and I've screwed it up. And you got this little speech in your head for him, like a kid that got caught and he still got to drive home and explain to his parents. You know, you just got the speech already. If you just give me another chance, I'll I'll never do it again. And hey, here's what I'm going to do. I'll never touch that. I'm never going to, you get your whole speech ready. And did you see the father? He's like, okay, sure. Robe, ring, fatted calf. The invitation is to come home. And so maybe you're here today and you've never come home. I'm telling you, I I have been in in this long enough to know that some of you, your whole understanding of the Christian faith is trying to tilt scales in your favor. All your spiritual activity is given over to get these things to tilt so that God might bless you. If I could do good and not do bad, God will bless me. If I can uh, stop this and start this, then, then God will bless me. And your entire focus is on these scales. Meanwhile, you have a heavenly father that desires intimacy and to cover you with his power. And that's what the gospel affords. A throwing ourselves on the mercy of Jesus and a covering from a heavenly father who is perfect in all of his ways. So here's the, let's call it a double invitation. Maybe this is just like blown your circuits today. I don't know. Maybe you have never heard the gospel from this angle. Uh, I mean, you've heard you're a sinner. You've heard Jesus died for you. You're, but you've never actually heard, yeah, yeah. And he rejoices over you in gladness. And not because of what you're doing, but because you throw yourself on his mercy to be justified. So you don't have to justify yourself. You, you can be justified by him. Well, I don't know if I won't fail him. Well, he's going to make you a new creation and you're going to fail him and he's going to rejoice over you with gladness. And as you navigate all the hurt and confusion and doubt and anger and sadness and lust and all the compulsions of your heart, your heavenly father just invites you to sit in the quietness of his love and receive from him peace. This is near impossible for us to believe, which is why Paul closes the argument like this, that the spirit testifies to our spirit that we're children of God. How does that happen? Here's how it happens. We love him and long to be with him. That is the simple baseline objective evidence of salvation. It's not perfection. It's not I used to be and now I'm not. It's I love him and want to be near him. 
And so if you've never said yes to this, I want to just give you the invitation. I'm here to say you have a heavenly father that wants to rejoice over you in gladness. Gosh, for men, most of the people I know, we never had that. We never had quiet love to sit in. We never were rejoiced over in gladness. And even if we were, we kind of made us self-righteous rather than, right? Sin's tricky and quick. And So what's it look like for you to surrender to that today? Here, here in a moment, I'm going to pray, and there are going to be some men and women in the back, and they're ready just to pray with you. You can just go like, hey, I want a, I want a heavenly Father who loves me and, and, and is going to uh, move towards me in intimacy. Or, or maybe you're, in, you're a Christian, man. You know you are. You already have said yes to this. And yet, over a period of time, man, you, you've just drifted back to the self. You've drifted back to others. You've drifted back to the world. You, you've drifted back to religion. You're just working real hard right now, cleaning up this area of your life. It's not a bad thing. It's just a terrible salvific thing. It doesn't bring about salvation. And I would argue that nearness to Jesus does more to destroy sin in your life than your best laid plans ever will. And so maybe the the thing that you'll need to do today is to repent of running back to chains rather than walking in the freedom of the children of God. Listen, I'm going to say this and pray. He loves you desires for you to experience that love. He, he's, not, he's not something that should be rolling around in the back of your head with all the other bits and pieces of your life. He, he's your heavenly father and wants no distance from you. Even if you think you look really unlovely right now, I honestly think that's when fathers pull closest to their children, when their faces are bloody and they know they've blown it. It's in that moment that grace has to be there. Why don't you come home? I'm going to pray. If you want to say yes to Jesus, men and women in the back, if you just need to repent or pray or ask the Holy Spirit to remind you of his love, do that. But let's move towards our heavenly father in these next few moments. Father, we bless you in the name of Jesus. We thank you that the invitation is to come home. The invitation is to not run, to not create any space, to not leave any space between us, but to to press in by faith and ask that the Holy Spirit would allow us to experience you and experience your love in deep and rich ways. Help us, man. A lot of us, we're carrying around some real daddy wounds. Makes us see you in weird ways. Correct that. Heal that. Come in power upon us now. And it's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen.